Every teenager is, of course, different, but it's close to a universal given that life between the ages of 13 and 20 can be absolutely tumultuous for everyone involved. Lisa Demore is a clinical psychologist who's written several books aimed at helping teens and their parents manage the transition from child to adult. Her latest is called The Emotional Lives of Teenagers, Raising Connected, Capable, and Compassionate Adolescents. And it brings Lisa Demore back to our airwaves tonight from Cleveland, Ohio. And it's really good of you, Lisa, to make some time for us again. Thanks so much. How are you doing? I'm great. Thank you so much for having me back on your show. I love your show. Oh, I appreciate that so much. I, I want to start by following up on something that we actually covered on this program a couple of weeks ago. There was a Canadian study that was uh, sort of taking a, a good, long, hard look at how teens had done through the pandemic and in terms of their mental health. And I think the shocking thing that emerged from this study was that they discovered that teens were a lot more resilient than they thought they would be. There were mental health adverse effects, but that teens had bounced back. And that surprised a lot of people because, of course, other studies that we've seen in the past say that this whole last few years has been an absolute disaster uh, for teens in particular as it relates to their mental health. I want, you know, knowing you're going to be on this program, I want to get your impression. What say you on that? So what I would say is that for a lot of teenagers, when life returned to normal, when they were able to go to school, when they were able to see their friends, a lot of them actually got right back on course, sort of returned to their normal developmental trajectories. And a lot of them were just so happy to be back with their friends and their teachers and their coaches that they embraced it fully. There are, however, a subset of teenagers who suffered tremendously through the pandemic and then have continued to suffer after the pandemic or who ran into difficulties during the pandemic that have been very, very hard to recover from. So the truth is it's a mixed picture. Some teenagers, a lot of teenagers, are doing really well and thriving, but we do, without question, have a higher number of teenagers that we are concerned about now than we did before the pandemic. Yeah, mental health got on everybody's radar in a way that I suspect it hadn't before the pandemic started, and a lot of teens are now, I guess, self, self-identifying, self-analyzing their mental health issues. How does one distinguish between the typical teen feelings of being confused, being anxious, because it's typical teenage stuff, and actual clinical depression and anxiety? That's such an important question, and that's really one of the main reasons I wrote this most recent book, which is to really help clarify what mental health is. Because too often, for all of us, much less teenagers, Mental health gets equated with feeling calm or relaxed or at ease or happy. And those are wonderful things, but those actually don't define mental health. What we expect to see when we are looking for mental health are two things. One, having feelings that fit the circumstance, having an emotion that makes sense in the moment. So if a teenager is anxious because they have a big test coming and they're not ready, that's an appropriate response. The other is handling the emotion appropriately, handling it well. So we'd love to see that teenager start studying or seek out help for the test. What we don't want to see are teenagers who just avoid altogether as a way to manage their anxiety or who might be like turn to substances as a way to bring their anxiety under control. So we're looking for feelings that fit and good management of those feelings. And then to your question about clinical depression and anxiety. The way that we think about sadness versus depression is that if you're sad, you're sad about something. And if something nice comes along, it tends to cheer you up. When you're depressed, you're sort of sad or low about everything, or there's a sense of a blankness. And even when things go well, you don't actually feel better. And for clinical anxiety, the way we make the distinction between healthy and unhealthy anxiety is that healthy anxiety happens in response to a threat. We all come equipped with anxiety. It helps to keep us safe. We want to have an anxiety reaction if um, we're walking down the street and somebody's suddenly walking very closely behind us in a way that is uncomfortable. Anxiety will help to keep us safe. We only diagnose clinical anxiety or unhealthy anxiety if anxiety is present but there's no threat, there's nothing wrong, or if the anxiety is way out of proportion to the threat, much more pronounced than makes sense. So if we go back to that teenager getting ready for a test, we expect to see a little anxiety about a big, heavy test. We do not expect to see a panic attack. And if that happens, we um, are very good at treating both anxiety and then also depression. So does a panic attack almost automatically mean you should be seeking professional counsel for that kid? Not 
necessarily. Actually, panic attacks on their own are surprisingly common. About 30% of the population will have a panic attack over the course of their lives. We do get um, more concern, though, if panic attacks start to occur regularly, and especially if they start to change behavior, if people start to avoid things so as not to have a panic attack. Psychologists are very, very much on the lookout for avoidance as a way to manage distress, and we have certainly seen more of that in the wake of the pandemic. And let me follow up on the substance abuse reference that you mentioned uh, in the middle of that previous answer as well. Does does the revelation that your child may be abusing drugs or alcohol, again, automatically mean you should seek professional assistance for that child? That's an important question. Um, in truth, it is not altogether unusual for teenagers to experiment with substances, but experimentation can readily lead to unhealthy use, and certainly experimentation on its own can have really, really terrifying outcomes. So parents want to be attentive to how their teenagers are managing emotions, and they especially want to be attentive if they are under the impression or have any reason to believe that their teenager is using substances as a way to relieve uncomfortable feelings. So if they're sneaking the odd drink or the odd joint, that's not necessarily the end of the world. What you're describing falls within what is not, is certainly within the typical range of adolescent behavior. But again, things have changed in recent years. We certainly have much more frightening landscape of drugs, much more dangerous landscape of drugs. So the key on this is for parents to be having good conversation, open lines of communication with their teenagers about substances, about keeping themselves safe, really at any level. But in truth, it is not altogether unusual for teenagers to do some experimentation, again, Safety is the key. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I can't imagine there's a parent watching us now who has not experienced some kind of extreme behavior. They've witnessed extreme behavior by their teens. But I bet there are lots of teenagers who have witnessed extreme behavior by their parents as well. So can we establish off the top, is teenage extreme behavior, generally speaking, worse than adult extreme behavior? It's interesting. Teenagers are in the middle of a pretty fabulous and intense neurological renovation. Their brains are actually overhauling. And the nature of this renovation is that it upgrades the brain, it makes the entire brain faster, more efficient, more powerful. And for teenagers, this process unfolds in the way that the brain developed initially, which is from the lower order regions where the emotions are housed, up to the higher order regions behind the forehead where perspective maintaining is housed. And what this means is that when teenagers become upset or activated, excited, their feelings are really, really powerful and really, really intense and can, in fact, outmatch their ability to have a good sense of control or perspective. We generally expect this to see, to see this kind of come into balance by about age 24 and so typically, adult reactions to powerful emotions are a bit more regulated than adolescent reactions to powerful emotions. That said, I would say one of the hardest things about the pandemic for teenagers is just as they were going through something incredibly difficult, so were their families, so were their teachers who care for them. They were themselves really struggling, and everyone who constitutes their support system was also struggling. So that is part of what made this such an incredibly hard time. Mm -hmm. Emotions have long been seen as the enemy of reason. And I want to ask you whether you believe that to be the case. Well, most of the time that is not the case. The way that psychologists regard in emotions is that they're fundamentally informational. They are data about how our lives are going. And we want to tune into them, both the positive and the negative, for feedback on our choices, on how you know, we're moving along in our lives, and to really use both negative and positive emotions as guidance for what we want to do less of or more of. Now, for teenagers, every once in a while, emotions can get the better of their reasoning. And the way psychologists think about this is in terms of what we call cold and hot reasoning, so cold reasoning is the kind of reasoning that teenagers do when they are in situations that are not charged by social or emotional factors. So this might be, you know, four o'clock in the afternoon on a Friday when they're talking with their parent and the parent asks like, you know, what are the plans for tonight? What are you gonna do? And the teenager may say, I'm going to this party, but I don't intend to drink. And the teenager in that situation almost always means it. But what we know is that for teenagers in particular, 
When they get to the party, hot reasoning can take over. This is a different way that they think. It is very much informed by wanting to be connected socially or by you know, revved up emotions. And so once they get to the party, if someone they like offers them a beer, they may very well drink that beer. So what parents need to do as they are talking with teenagers, especially about safety, especially about making plans, is under cold conditions, those afternoon in your kitchen conditions, we want parents to help teenagers make plans for hot conditions. So the teenager says, I'm not gonna drink, that's not my plan. And the parent says, that's terrific. Okay, what is the plan if you get to the party and that kid you have a crush on offers you a drink, what are you gonna do then? And really try to think it through. This will not guarantee that the teenager is gonna make the right choice, but it is much better for teenagers in hot conditions if they are not trying to figure things out on the fly. Now, I'm not gonna pretend for a second this is not a question, this next question, that is uh, out of the mouth of a parent as opposed to a kid. Uh, so I admit that bias right up front here. Here's the question. Why are teenagers so mean to their parents? Um, there are a lot of reasons for this. <laughs> One is teenagers have very powerful emotions and sometimes their breaks don't work so well. So it's not altogether unusual for teenagers to say something that is unkind and to regret it as soon as they've said it, but it's out of their mouth and there's nothing they can do. Another reason that teenagers can be unkind to their parents is that teenagers are trying to become separate. And part of how they separate themselves from us is to push away, to seem rejecting. And the key in this is for parents to not take it personally. That teenagers, by their nature, need to establish their independence. They don't always do it in the nicest way. And usually the best response for a parent is to not react to the initial unkindness. To say something like, I'm gonna pretend like I didn't hear that, or I don't think that came out the way that you meant for it to come out, or even something like, you know what, we don't ever talk to you like that, you're not gonna to talk to us like that, why don't you try again? I'm not sure anybody is that calm when they hear something from their kid in that moment to respond the way you just did, although in an ideal world, I agree, that's the way to go. Let me follow up with this. Do teenagers, as a general rule, are they harder on mom or dad in a traditional mother-father household? You know, when we've looked at the data on this, especially between girls and their mothers, what we see is that um, the relationship between girls and their mothers can be quite close, and at times it also can be quite a bit more combustible. Um, boys, I don't think we actually have particularly pronounced differences in terms of the treatment of parents, but we do know with girls that they can be harder on their moms, and again, we think that has to do with both the fact that they are sort of more intimate and often more intense in their relationships, and also girls are often working harder to push away and to become individual and separate, mm. and they don't always do it in the kindest ways. The key with teenagers is to really understand that adolescence is not something that teenagers are doing to their parents. It is a really challenging developmental phase that teenagers are working their way through. I'm always reminded of that line in The Godfather, tell Michael it was just business, right? It's, exactly. They don't mean it personally, it's just business. That's the way it goes. They don't, and here's another way to think about it. Teenagers have to become independent. That is their job. We want them to really be ready by about age 18 to go move away and move on. To become independent while living under their parents' roof basically being you know, needy of their parents, depending on their parents for basically everything, is an incredibly hard thing to do. So the way teenagers do it is they accomplish psychological independence. They become more private, they are um, more reserved when they're with us, they can push us away at times. And if adults who are around this can appreciate that this is a tricky thing, to become an independent person while being dependent on the adults in the home, I think it can make it easier to not take it personally. It feels sometimes in my first person observation like mom is not necessarily all that invested in creating a, a child who's ready to move out at 18 and become very independent, where dad may be more comfortable with that notion. That's not a first person observation in my own situation, but I've seen it with many others. Is there something to that? You know, it probably is. Um, I'm sure that there are a lot of households where that's true. And I think what it also gets at is it's a huge pleasure to take care of our kids. I'm a mom myself. I have two daughters. I love taking care of them. I love um, providing for them. And I really think that you can actually simultaneously get kids ready to operate independently 
while also taking real pleasure in um, doing nice things for them, helping them around the house, uh, being there for them. And actually, it's, I think it's one of those pleasures we actually don't talk nearly enough about. We talk a lot about um, equipping kids to manage in the outside world, but I don't think we always talk about how much fun it is to actually um, take good care of them at home. Hmm. There's so much about gender differences today, and uh, while we don't necessarily have to get into all of the uh, ultra-political uh, observations about that right now, could you weigh in on when you think gender differences matter and when they don't as it relates to teens? Well, so when I think about my work in the area of emotions, one very clear finding that we have with regard to traditional gender categories is that girls are socialized to talk more fluently about their feelings, and they're also given more cultural permission to talk about a wide range of feelings. They can be angry, but they can also be sad or anxious. Boys, on the other hand, are generally socialized not to be very expressive about emotion, and to the degree that they are allowed emotion in sort of cultural context, they tend to usually only be allowed to be angry, to express anger, or among other boys, to express pleasure at someone else's expense. So not particularly pleasant emotions and also a very narrow range. So as adults, what we want is to raise kids of any gender who are comfortable expressing a wide range of emotions. And one thing I think that can make a big difference is especially for boys, is if the men around them are able to talk more fluently about their own emotions and also to ask boys about their feelings. One thing that became clear to me as I was working on this book is that when boys, and it's usually around you know, age 12, 13, 14, when they're really working hard to consolidate a sense of masculinity, a lot of boys can decide that feelings are for girls or talking about feelings is for girls. And then if they happen to live in a heterosexual two-parent household, if the only person who is raising conversations about feelings is their mom, that may be really well-meaning. It also may prove their point. It may confirm that for them that talking about feelings is a female thing to do. So that's why it's so important that for boys in particular, the men in their lives, either in the home, school, elsewhere, are the ones who really take up the work of developing a language for feelings and talking about a wide range of feelings, including vulnerable emotions. But if I heard you right, it sounded like uh, men are socialized to be that way and girls are socialized to be a different way. How much of all of what you've just described, though, is actually innate in each of us? None of it. I promise you, at the moment that um, kids are born, they could go any variety of directions. There is nothing biological about the fact that girls are um, socialized to be or ultimately become much more fluent in the expression of emotion and boys less so. It is very much a cultural phenomenon. Hmm. When does a teen's gender matter in terms of the way they experience mental health problems? So one of the really um, classic and consistent findings is, again, it's a function of socialization, is that when girls are in emotional distress, they tend to collapse in on themselves. They tend to experience depression or anxiety. And then when boys are in emotional distress, they tend to act out. So they may um, be unkind to others. They may get themselves in trouble. They you know, may engage in delinquent behavior. And so we've always sort of noticed this distinction. We, make, we call them internalizing disorders versus externalizing disorders. And the key thing for us to remember is there, this is all distress. And, and there's not one form of distress that we care more about than another. And that boys especially may need an extra measure of empathy because they don't always express distress in a way that um, makes people feel very caring towards them. Hmm. Okay, let's, um, I'm gonna go back on what I just said a few minutes ago and let's get a little political right now because okay. I have to say when I was, um, well, when I was a teenager, it's, it's possible I was thick as a plank and I did not appreciate the fact that there were people who identified as um, non-binary back in the day. And there are, of course, um, infinite more numbers of kids nowadays who are identifying as non-binary and beyond. Help us understand why that's happening now. Well, one thing we can say for sure is that gender has never been as binary as we have treated it as being historically, that it's always been something quite a bit more fluid. But in truth, we are now raising a generation of teenagers who view gender as vastly more fluid than previous generations did. So I don't know that it's that um, it wasn't fluid and now it has become fluid, but we certainly are raising a generation of teenagers who do not feel 
so confined into traditional gender categories um, and who can identify other categories in between categories or categories that include both genders or who also feel free to move across different gender categories. And this is a pretty um, dramatic difference from pre previous generations and without question one that a lot of parents are trying to catch up to. So is that to say it has ever been thus and we just may not have been as hip to it back in the day? That's what most psychologists think. Hmm. All right, if you're a parent and you have a child, teenager approaches you and says, Mom, Dad, here's what I think I am. What do you do? So if we go to the research literature and if we look at this through the lens of supporting adolescent mental health, which is the lens I'm always looking at the world through, what the research literature tells us is that ideally the parents are affirming that they support the expression of a non-traditional gender identity, that they are curious, that they are open. Now, what affirming looks like will be, you know, can cover a wide range of responses and behaviors, and that will really be different kid to kid and family to family. I don't have to tell you, there is tremendous pushback to that approach nowadays from many quarters. I get emails probably every other day of the, uh, of the week from people who say, this has gone too far. What do I say to them? So what I would say is that in the care of children, and I've done this for my entire career, there is no one answer that is right for every child on everything. The research tells us that affirmation is really important in terms of protecting mental health. I'm on the side of mental health. But what that looks like, again, there's no script. There's no one prescription that is going to be the right way to go about this for every child. Now, I appreciate that, but, but presumably age matters here. If, if a 10-year-old child approaches you saying, I'm non-binary or I identify with a different sex, versus an 18-year-old doing it, I presume the parental reaction ought to be different in each case? Um, I think that probably would inform the reaction, but there's also a whole lot of other variables the parents will have access to. You know, they've known that 10-year-old for 10 years. Some parents will say, we've been waiting for this information. We've sort of assumed it was coming. Other parents will find it to be quite surprising. So again, um, as with anything in the care of children, there is no one-size-fits-all answer, and I think we want to be cautious of anyone who suggests that there is one way that always needs to be honored when thinking about how to move forward. Okay, let me t um, let's steer our discussion now towards conflict. I know I hear from grandparents and parents that today's kids, today's teenagers, what's the right expression here? Pushback is not stark enough. Uh, they're lippier, they're more in your face as teenagers today than, than either my generation or our parents' generation ever would to the previous generation when they were growing up. What's that about? You know, we don't really know, but here's a theory that I'll float for us. We talk a lot about social media. We talk a lot about the harms of social media. One of the things we don't actually talk about nearly enough is the fact that teenagers are often engaging in pretty rapid and high-level discourse on social media. When I've interviewed teenagers about their emerging political understandings or their views on controversial topics, they will often tell me that it's by engaging about those topics online with peers or with people they don't know where they can see how arguments are made, then they can see you know, counter arguments, and then they can see criticisms of the arguments and watch it all unfold, that they really learned about how to make cases, you know, what they believe in. They have very strong views often. And what I will say is that when I am talking to teenagers, I'm often quite impressed by how sophisticated their reasoning is, how deeply they have thought about very complex things, how developed their arguments are, how quick they are to point out the shortcomings in the arguments that other people make. And it's not always fun to be on the receiving end of this, but I think we should actually stand back and honor the fact that teenagers today are often much more fluent in a pretty sophisticated form of argumentation than we were as teenagers, and they are certainly thinking about, I would say often, much bigger and deeper things than we were thinking about as teenagers. Well, okay, but I'm gonna follow up on that with, with uh, not a very sophisticated follow-up, but I'm gonna get right down in the gutter, and I'll tell you where it comes from. I just did a book on a former Prime Minister of Canada who I remember shaking his head in shock when he saw how his grandchildren were talking to his own children and the use of profanity, which never would have been allowed in the former prime minister's household when he was doing the parenting, 
And he just, you know, he kind of shook his head at, at what this generation of parents allows the younger generation to get away with nowadays. Have we given this younger generation uh, too much freedom, too much agency to speak their minds and, and be lippy? Well, I promise you there's no generic that describes all families. But what I think is important is that when young people are making arguments or when they're in disagreement with us, that we capitalize on those moments to teach them how to make their points in a way that is respectful. And there's a couple of reasons for them to do that. First of all, it's just generally a good thing to be respectful. Second of all, it's actually how you get taken seriously. So if um, a young person is making an argument that is a fair enough argument, but they're going about it in a way that is off-putting or offensive, that's a great time for the adult on the receiving end of it not to react you know, in a way that is unpleasant or you know, meets them in that um, you know, kind of rolling in the mud place, but instead says, hey, you know what, you may have a point, but if you're going to make it that way, no one's going to listen to you. No one's going to take you seriously. Can you make it in a more sophisticated and also respectful way? Okay, Lisa, there's so much in this book, and I'm, um, you know, we could talk for hours here and still not get through all of it, but I do want to ask you just one final question, and that is, is there anything I have not asked about so far that I've, that I've missed that you think is really important for, I guess, parents and teens who are watching this right now? What I would say is that if we move toward the definition of mental health that I proposed at the beginning, that feelings, you know, are going to happen, distress on its own is not evidence of a mental health concern. In fact, it can often be signs that the person is working perfectly, that we really focus instead on how emotions are managed, not whether they are positive or negative. Then it really gets us into an interesting conversation about how we manage emotions. And the way psychologists think about this is you don't prevent distress, you don't get rid of it quickly, but you can regulate it. And in regulating it, what we're actually going to rely on is both strategies that involve expression, expression, talking about feelings, sometimes expressing them non-verbally in ways that do no harm, such as going for a run or playing music. But it also involves having ways to bring emotions back under control. Um, I really am interested in all of the ways that teenagers on their own can tame negative emotions. They comfort themselves, they find a brief distraction, they engage in problem solving. And I'm really interested also in how adults can support both the expression of emotion to get relief and also strategies that help teenagers feel like they've got their feet back under them. Amen. The Emotional Lives of Teenagers, Raising Connected, Capable, and Compassionate Adolescents. And we are delighted that it has brought Lisa DeMoor back to our airwaves tonight here in the province of Ontario. Lisa, thanks so much for joining us again. Thank you for having me. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.